two verses to that. <laughs> if you have your Bibles with you this morning, would you open them to the book of 2 Timothy? Stand as we read from God's Word. 2 Timothy chapter 4. But I hope will be familiar verses to you. Beginning at verse 1. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word by our head. We thank you, Lord, for your word. Pray that you'll speak to us from it anew and afresh this morning. And for that, we'll thank you. Amen. You may be seated. There has never been a day when the need to preach the word was so important. We've always needed to do that, but especially today when so many are not doing that. Whether it's prophets, preachers, Sunday school teachers, Bible school leaders, Bible study leaders, anybody that is speaking for the Lord these days, we are not called to be the originator of the message. We are simply called to be the bearer of the message. Amen. Prophets, preachers are not called to be creative about what they say. They're simply called to be obedient, <clears throat> to preach the word. God told Jonah in Jonah chapter 3 verse 2, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. This, along with what Paul wrote to Timothy, should be the pattern for all those who speak for God today. To preach the Word. And to preach what God bids or what God wants us to say. Paul says that preaching the word means we will do it in season and out of season. By that, he means we will press it home on all occasions, whether it's convenient or not, or whether people want to hear it or not. There's to be a sense of urgency which should characterize our preaching. A sense of urgency, which I have to confess is sadly missing from many of the pulpits across America today. This will place on us the responsibility to do so, and it will cause us to repute, reprove and rebuke when needed, and to exhort false prophets, have always thrived because people crave good news. <clears throat> Life can often be hard on us, and we do need encouragement. There's no doubt about that. And there's a time and a place for encouragement. And there's nothing wrong with wanting to be encouraged. The gospel certainly gives us Encouragement. Matter of fact, the word gospel itself means good news. And if we accept the fact that Jesus died for our sins on the cross, and that He wants to save us from them, 
And then walk with us, helping and empowering us all along the way until we get to heaven. Well, that ought to be a wonderful source of encouragement to us. Hebrews 13.5 says that after we have become Christians, we are to be content as, with such things as you have. For he saith, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. Mm -hmm. And if knowing that doesn't keep you encouraged, nothing else will. But Paul warns us that there is coming a day in the church in the last days when men will have itching ears and when men in the church will not want to hear the word preached but will want to be told what they want to hear instead of what they need to hear. They will want to hear what makes them feel good. And nothing that even in the remotest sounds negative. That's the crying cry of the church these days. Tell us good stuff that will make us feel good. That day is definitely upon us. And this sign, which is often overlooked by many, is as much of a sign that we're living in the last days as the increase in earthquakes and pestilences and all the rest is. Maybe it's even more so of a sign than these. When everything looks like it's going bad in the world, which it most certainly is, it will be the same in the church as well. To our shame. The Greek word kinethemiai is translated there, itching ears. It means to desire only that which is pleasant and to have itching ears for such. They have an itch that must be scratched, William Barclay said. He put it this way. They have ears which have to be continually titillated with novelty, good stuff, makes them feel good. They will say to their preachers, don't talk to us about stuff like sin and, and judgment and hell or God's wrath. We don't want to hear stuff like that. That might make us feel convicted. We might go home and feel bad. I don't damage our self-esteem. We want to feel good about ourselves. So preach to us only what's pleasant and only that which will make us feel good about ourselves or we won't come back and hear you again next week, preacher. Many don't want the Word of God in the church. They want fluff. They want to even be entertained. At that point, the preacher has a choice. The Sunday school teacher has a choice to either preach the Word or to please the people. And I'm saddened to have to tell you, which I think you already know it, that America's pulpits are filled these days with people-pleasers instead of men and women who will preach the Word of God without apology or without compromise. If you want proof of that, ask yourself who, is the big, who has the biggest church in America and who is one of the most popular priesters in America? Why, it's old Smiley. As I heard somebody refer to him the other day as Joel Osteen, old Smiley. What makes him so popular? Well, when they go and ask his people why they like him so much, they tell you he's always smiling. And he's always building us up. 
And more importantly, he never says anything negative. That's what they'll tell you. When he wrote the book, Become a Better You, that was the title of it, I watched a reporter interview him about the book. The reporter said, you have seven principles printed in this book that you say will improve people's lives. And at that point, old Smiley started naming them. Number one, be positive towards yourself. Number two, develop better relationships. Number three, embrace the place where you are. And at that point, the reporter broke in after the third one, and he said, there's not one mention of God in Jesus Christ in there. Joel Osteen responded by saying, and I quote him exactly, that's just my message. There are a lot better people qualified to say, here's a book to explain the scriptures to you. I don't think that's my gift. Then why in the world are you preaching? <coughs> then why in the world do you have America's largest church? And why is America's largest church putting up with you? All across America, preachers are letting people to learn how to be a better you. They're telling them. Sermon today is learn how to be a better you. Learn how to be financially successful. Learn how to have more self-esteem. <coughs> Learn even how to have a better sex life. Yep. Even that one is being preached a lot these days, and the crowds flock to hear that. They're saying anything but preaching the gospel. Folks, I hear people say we need a revival in America. We don't need a revival in America, folks. We need a revival in the church. Amen. America is never going to be revived until the church is revived. Truth within the church today is about as popular as a bad case of shingles. <laughs> True Christianity is going out of existence in America these days. That is why most of what you watch on Christian TV is a bunch of baloney. False teachers abound on Christian TV. I heard another good preacher say something very interesting along these lines recently. He said, false teachers are God's judgment on people who don't want God but in the name of religion, plan on getting everything their carnal heart desires. That's why, and listen to this, he says that's why Joel Osteen is raised up. Those people who sit under him are not victims of him. He is the judgment of God upon them because he wants exactly what they want, and it's not God. End quote. Well put. I think he's exactly right on what he said. Joel Osteen is not God's gift to the church. He may very well be a part of God's judgment on the church in these last days. Amen and ouch. Now Paul said something very interesting along these lines to the Galatian church. In Galatians 1, 6 through 9, he said, and he says this to a New Testament church, mind you, not long after Jesus has left. He said, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. Imagine this. Just years after Jesus left, one of the best churches that 
the New Testament had, the church in Galatia. Paul writes to them and says, I'm flabbergasted that you guys have moved to another gospel. He goes on and says, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than what we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. Paul said. He goes on and he says, As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that you have received, let him be accursed. If the church is guilty of preaching something other than the message of Christ and His death on the cross and His resurrection and His coming again, Paul says, let them be accursed. Amen. Paul says you have moved to another gospel. And yet people like Brian McLaren, for instance, say things like, the cross is almost a distraction and false advertising for God. Think of that. And people who ought to know better eat that up. They actually put him on the list of the 25 most influential Christians in America. And he says the cross is almost a distraction and false advertising for God. Folks, that is what it's all about. Amen. Amen. That's not false Amen. advertising for God. Weren't for that, we wouldn't have anything to, we wouldn't have a home. Nothing. Because we're living in the last days and people's itching ears are eating the baloney up and loving what many pulpits in America are now feeding them. People were opening their ears to any teacher that will relieve their particular itch, regardless of how it measures up against the truth. So it is no accident that we are seeing today men whose ears itch for the smooth and the comfortable word and who are willing to reward handsomely the man who is willing to compromise to speak it. Hearers of this type have rejected the truth and prefer to hear a lie. And this is a major sign, folks, that we are indeed living in the last days. The church doesn't want to hear the Word of God preached anymore. Give us anything but that. But did you know that the majority of God's people have almost always rejected what His prophets said to them? Godless men have always displayed a preference for the prophet who prophesies smooth things who tells them nice-sounding things that are devoid of humility or confession of sin or repentance or judgment or something like that. One is reminded of the story we find in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 28 and, or 27 and 28. We're told in verses 3 and 4 of chapter 27, that dignitaries from Edom and Moab and Ammon and Tyre and Sidon had all come to Jerusalem to confer with King Hezekiah. They were trying to figure out how they could mount a united counterattack against the Babylonians that were coming, who were going to invade. God told Jeremiah, if you remember the story, to put a wooden yoke around his neck and to go tell them that their strategy was not going to work. They might as well just save their breath. For God was going to give them into the hands of the king of Babylon as a punishment for their sin. He told them in verses 9 through 10 not to listen to your prophets 
nor to your diviners, nor to your dreamers, nor to your enchanters, nor to your sorcerers, which speak unto you, saying, You shall not serve the king of Babylon. For they prophesy a lie to you, Jeremiah said. So Jeremiah, wearing this oxen's yoke around his neck, I imagine he was some sight, wearing a wooden yoke around his neck, he says to King Hezekiah in verse 12, Bring your necks under the yoke of the king of Babylon and serve him and his people and you'll live if you do that. But Zedekiah didn't want to hear that. He didn't want to listen. And conveniently, a false prophet named Hananiah stood up in Jeremiah 28, 4 and said, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, saying, I have broken the yoke of the king of Babylon. Which the people love to hear that. He went as far in verse 10 as challenging Jeremiah. He took the yoke off of Jeremiah's neck and he broke it. And he challenged Jeremiah. I'm telling the truth, you're not. But Jeremiah responded to Hananiah by telling him, Hear now, Hananiah, the Lord hath not sent thee but thou makest this people to trust a lie. Therefore thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will cast thee from off the face of the earth. This year thou shalt die, because thou hast taught rebellion against the Lord. You know what it says to finish the chapter? So Hananiah the false prophet died the same year in the seventh month. And the kingdom of Judah, as well as its king, they were carried away into Babylon to serve Nebuchadnezzar with yokes of iron around their necks instead of yokes of wood. Just as Jeremiah said it would be because they would not listen to what he said. All through history, men have rejected what God tried to say to them through his prophets, and through his preachers. But in these days, we are seeing it like we've never seen it before. There is so much baloney being preached these days that when people do hear the truth, sometimes they hardly even recognize it. And our Christian bookstores are filled with anything but the gospel or the truth these days. Tyndale House has just now decided this past week to withdraw its best-selling 2010 book by Alex Malarkey and his father Kevin Malarkey that so many people got all excited about. The book was entitled, The Boy That Came Back From Heaven. Everybody got excited about that. Oh, isn't that wonderful? Tyndale has now pulled it from the shelf. Why? Because apparently it was nothing but a bunch of malarkey by the malarkeys. You say, well, how do I know that? Who, what right do I have to judge that? Well, I'll tell you what right I have to say that. Because the kid come out this past week and said he lied and made up the whole story. He wrote a letter explaining it. Young Kevin said this, and I quote, remember this is the book that sold hundreds of thousands of copies and everybody in the church was raving over it and said how great this is. The kid said in his letter, I said I went to heaven because I thought it would get me attention. 
when I made the claims that I did, I had never read the Bible. That sounds like what Jim Baker said when he was in prison, remember? Mm -hmm. Jim Baker said from prison when they locked him up, well, I've never really read the Bible. He said, I've never read the Bible. People have profited from my lies, and they continue to. They should read the Bible, which is enough. Sounds like he should, too. Well, that's right. The Bible is the only source of truth. Amen. Now imagine, the Christian world was all excited. The boy who came back from heaven, look what he's telling us. And the kid says, now, I made the whole thing up just to get attention. Besides, shouldn't somebody in the church have said or recognized that Paul said he was caught up into the third heaven and when he came back he wasn't allowed to tell what he saw? Amen. What in the world's wrong with us? Don't ever allow yourself to have itching ears like so many in these last days have. Don't allow yourself to be quick to believe the latest new thing that's coming down the pike. Instead, every time you read your Bible or hear it taught or preached, you should ask God to speak to you through it, even if it reproves or rebukes you. And somebody ought to be doing a little more of this in the church. This is what 1 John 4, 1 says we're to do. We're to believe not every spirit, but we are to try the spirits whether they are of God. Why? Because many false prophets are going out into the world. We're supposed to hold these things up and and take a look at them through spiritual eyes, through Scripture, prove them by Scripture, ask God about them. But when somebody writes a book and says, I just come back from heaven, oh wow, tell me what you saw. I'll pay money to get your book. May God help us. Even if you made it up, I'll get excited about it. Amos chapter 8 verse 11 says, Behold the days come, saith the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land. There is a famine. Not a famine of bread, nor of thirst for water, but a famine of hearing the words of the Lord. Amen. That's right, amen. My friend, that day has come. Yep. We are living in that day. That day is here. We should test the spirits. We should not be ready to believe the most exciting and pleasant thing that comes along, but be cautious and hold it up and test the spirit to see whether this is from God or not. Or if it's just some kid making up a lie to get attention and make a bunch of people rich. Boy, hope nobody here bought that book or you feel like a fool now, don't you? <laughs> oh, may God help us. If you did, may it be a lesson. May it be a lesson to us to not just believe everything that comes along because we're living in the day when men have itching ears, when men want to hear exciting things, when men want to hear smooth-sounding things when men want to get away from the Word of God, which is what we really need to preach. If God were here this morning in the flesh, Jesus, to that sermon He would say, be careful who you listen to. Be careful what you believe. Be careful what you allow yourself to read and let it go into your head to influence you. Because there's a lot of junk out there. Amen. A lot of stuff that has nothing to do with what God is really trying to say. We should love to tell the old story. The old story about Jesus 
and the cross and the grave and he's coming again. Let's stand. Let's bow our heads. Join together in a closing word of prayer. Carol, will you please dismiss us with prayer?